getting started. Um, from my understanding, a lot of stuff will be uh, thrashed out in discussion and questions and so on, but um, breaking the code skills for a digital era. So go back a couple hundred years ago, you know, people didn't really think that reading and writing was that important. Like you got your day to day life, and it was kind of a thing that was reserved for those who were highly ed educated. Um, but as time progressed and reading and writing became more prominent in society, people realized the impact and necessity for it. And then some other things happened as well, like you had the printing press, Bibles and vernacular. I like to think that Back to the Future played a strong part in it. Um, and reading became a very mainstream thing. Then you fast forward another couple hundred years to you know modern day planet Earth, where we're surrounded by technology and it's, it, it's such a quintessential part of our society. Um, that now people are starting to become curious as to how it works and how we can manipulate it and use it and innovate. And maybe not so much this generation, our generation, but the generation that are coming. So I'm talking about the 12, 13 year olds um, and below. And this is largely brought on by things like you know the, the widespread uh, computers being everywhere, smartphones and the social network made it pretty cool to be a geek. So this is, uh, this is what they call a map of the internet. And this kind of illustrates all like the major points connectivity around the world. And in this big, big map of the internet, all the information to create the next Facebook or innovate the next massive thing is there. I mean, it, it's all there. It shouldn't be that too big a thing to create this next, gen next generation of uh, skilled uh, IT workforce. But there's one problem with it. Um, and the one solution to how we create this next um, this next generation, this next workforce, purely lies in exposure in education. At the moment, in primary and secondary level, majority of places there is no exposure to coding. Um, things have been developed in such a sandbox way that you're never exposed to rough edges. Um, I mean, on the iPad and iPhone, for example, everything is sandbox, so you don't really have uh, a chance until you know or really know where to go to code on it. Um, so it purely comes down to exposure. So this grew frustration for me. I've been programming, my own personal background is I've been uh, developing software since I've been about nine years old. And growing up, the one thing that frustrated me was why there's never any coding in the education system. Um, that if you wanted to do coding, you had to go to third level, you had to know which course to pick. And even then there was about a 75% dropout slash failure rate. So kind of going back to my own story and how I personally realized that um, and Bill, through his own exploits and adventures, found out that there was an interest for this. My own story was, that um, back, as I continued to grow up in this system where there was no uh, exposure to coding or uh, no support for it, um, this, was, this was me when I won my first programming award at age 12 years old. I'd like to think I've changed a bit since then. But fast forward on a few years, and I was in sixth year, and I won a, at Christmas time, I won an uh, award for uh, web development. And this was around the time that the, so, uh, the social network film had its peak of popularity. And after it was called out of the school intercom, a few people approached me and said, hey James, that's really cool. Well, how are things like iPhone apps made or how are things like Facebook made? So um, I decided to hold a impromptu small get together of people who are interested in technology in my school and maybe teach them small things. But keep it very secret and very low level. Kind of like Fight Club, but with keyboards. Um, <laughs> so um, initially what I thought would be maybe four or five of my friends showing up after school to the computer room to learn to do this, um, and you know, probably be like the breakfast club, keep it all good. It turned out to be about 40 people from my school. And through there, for the rest of the year, twice a week, I would teach computer, uh, computer coding and how to develop websites, games, and so on. So that was the exposure to this group of people. And the thing with coding is it's kind of an infectious activity, because as soon as you expose one bu uh, bunch of people and they're developing their websites and they go home and they show their siblings, their families, their friends, you know, things that they made, and how easy they could do it, demystify the whole area. More people wanted to do it. And steady as our computer club uh, grew in school, we uh, external uh, pupils from other schools wishing to come after school to do it. Um, so then when we met Bill, um, <clears throat> purely for me knowing how much it sucked in the education system and Bill seeing a massive demand for it, we kind of teamed up and created what is, is Coder Dojo. So really the two things that we can do to target in the education system to, to, really, to really nail this is exposure to it, uh, showing pupils, demystifying it, um, and again with this type of infectious activity. And because all the information exists out there on the internet, all you need is direction. If you go to a career guidance teacher and you say, 
you know, I'd like to go into living and make iPhone apps or I'd like to make web apps. Um, a career guidance teacher can't differentiate, nor can they tell you what the correct course for you to do is. Majority of times, uh, you shouldn't actually, if you're you know, hell-bent on creating iPhone apps, you shouldn't go to college. You should actually take those four years and go straight into the profession and just learn online. It's time better spent. However, you know, it's not the way that the system is at the moment. So those are two things we need to combat at the moment. Um, so kind of going on from, from Coder Dojo, and I'll bring you up to speed on what Coder Dojo is if you haven't heard of it. Um, young people essentially come on a regular basis, learn how to code, hack, create apps, games, and more. Um, and it's all 100% uh, free and all volunteer based. It's kind of like the Boy Scouts of coding in a sense. Um, and more officially, you know, this is Coder Dojo. Um, this would be Coder Dojo. And this would be Coder Dojo. So that kind of gives you a good illustration of the demand for this. And however, that it's not such a high level subject that you know you, you have to be post second level to do it. You see people as young as, I think this guy's like five or six here at this. Um, so it, it's something that's open to all ages. Um, and stuff that various dojos have done around it. It's not, very, it's not small, low level stuff. Um, you know, you've got HTML, CSS, JavaScript, which all websites on the, uh, on the web are programmed in, Google, Facebook, so on. C, uh, Node.js. Node is a language that's really come out of the woodwork in two years. It's being celebrated as a very uh, uh, real-time, very uh, uh, language that will have a big impact on technology, yet it's too recent for computer science courses to take in and factor it. Um, but it's something that, uh, that Coder Dojos are teaching the kids, um, and a variety of other subjects as well, and topics. So, in addition to all this, and coding is great, but you really need skills to go with just the, the knowledge of how to code. So with Coder Dojo, we've seen as well these kids that are making friends, learning problem solving skills. It's an environment to ask questions, get advice and direction, draw off what they've done, um, get around bounce ideas, collaborate, and a number of other things. And creep, uh, keeping the correct mentality of it, keeping things open source, free software, good conduct, and importantly, helping others. Again, with this kind of uh, infectious um, nature of it, by getting kids to teach other kids and spread it out, it's something that's very powerful in spreading this. Um, so some things we did differently to the education system. So first off, when me and Bill decided that uh, we wanted to keep it free and keep money completely out of it, uh, we kind of worried if, uh, if it would be abused as a free babysitting service. So he said if uh, you're a parent, if you're 12 or under, or if you're 12 or under, you have to bring a parent with you. And this had a, a few knock-on of, uh, effects. Um, it meant that kids who were only really interested would drag their parents out of bed on a Saturday morning. It meant that parents and kids would spend time together and bond. But it also meant that if a kid did not get something, um, that they, and a parent spot of this, the parent would be more comfortable putting up their hand and asking a question, and the kid would see that it was okay. And it created this whole environment of uh, asking questions was okay. Uh, these sessions with the self-led learning emphasis. So instead of having a very detailed kind of um, bullet point, uh, do this, 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 and this, kids were open to take something, a new aspect of a language or a new topic or something in the programming language and then expand it themselves. Um, or also Google and trying to add things so that there was no kind of restrictive rate at it, that people could excel uh, or go at their own pace as need to be. A relaxed atmosphere. Um, one rule, be cool. Um, just this kind of global thing that we have implemented across the organization. Get money out of it just to keep it more transparent and simple. Getting kids to bring their own laptops so that the, in order to set one up it was a lot simpler. Um, code homework for a place. In some places that had massive demand they started giving homework so you could secure a place. Um, I think Dublin when it started off it had a it would take a 90 on a Saturday and out a waiting list of over 200. Um, and when they would open bookings up on a Monday they'd, um, at about half five often they uh, I think their record for being booked out was under a minute, so they were more popular than Westlife. Um, so, and at the end, showing resources so that kids could um, go home and learn and continue outside of this environment. And getting kids teaching other kids. I mean, let's face it, we're all old. We're all old. We're expired. And the uh, environment that we grew up in is now different to what kids are growing up in at the moment. So most often, kids can convey things better than, uh, to each other than we could, because they can be a bit more contemporary or so on. Um, so I think in summation, um, every, there's all these tools and everything is out there uh, in order to make this happen. Um, and the, the root of, and it's not necessarily anybody's fault, but the root of the cause is in the education system and just exposing and getting information in there um, in a very, uh, in, a, in, a, in a proactive fashion. Um, but unfortunately, the Department of Education is another barrel of laughs. Altogether, so sometimes we have to create things exterior to the system in order to influence it. 
So now does anyone have any points of discussion or comments on that? Just kind of went through it like that. It was a lot slower when I practiced earlier on. <laughs> I suppose I'd just like to ask if I might just, um, it's kids, teaching kids, I'm just wondering is there, are there any kind of cross-generational aspects to it? Yes, um, so most often in adults, and we've got Ada, which brought it to Galway and did a massive success with it here as well, and he can testify to this, but you would have a, an adult and experienced person who would lead the session, but if, let's say, one kid got it here and another kid didn't get it, you'd get a kid to help another kid, or often if you've got... Uh, someone new who's coming in to a higher level class, uh, sometimes other kids can help that kid get up to speed. Um, so it's quite a, rather than kids leading the session, you, on a kind of more smaller level, you would have a lot of kids helping each other. Chris, can I just, oh, absolutely, maybe use the position to share here and just ask another question. What are the, what are the, I suppose, the issues? You said that um, you teach, um, I suppose, coding, apps, um, hacking and more, like I've read on your site too, about hackathons, I and mean, what is it that grabs people's interest that they want to learn? What are the driving forces? That people I think it's use? purely the ability to create something. Um, I think that kids want to be able to, um, if kids have an idea that this is a, a, a means to, to do it. I mean, it's not that when we go in in a very factual, technical way, we're illustrating each point of the language. It's like, hey, let's make a game or let's make a cool website for like your GA club or something. So it's the ability to create something and basically it's a, it's a whole new frontier. And there's something really powerful about a kid seeing their web page up on the internet for the first time. We call it the class manual code. Sorry, James. Yeah. No, I was just saying, we call it the class moment because the very first time, said time and time again, you get a kid, you give them a text editor, you get them to put in a few lines of HTML code, and you say, look, now write a message, any message you like. And they save the file and they open it in a web browser, and up comes this message that they've written in a web browser. Like they've created a little piece of the internet, albeit local on the laptop. And the look on their faces when you say, hey, look, you just created your first web page. The look on their faces is priceless, it's very energetic, but the universal core response is pretty much, that's class. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask, it, it seems that you're um, providing a really important service that maybe the education system should be providing, it's what you were suggesting. Has there been any attempt anywhere to try and learn from the Dojo and by departments of education anywhere? So, um... I think that the, the government has enough problems as it is at the moment, and uh, not so much on the, the forefront of the Department of Education. Most certainly there's been a few politicians that myself and Bill have conversed with, um, but it's more we're starting to see teachers kind of step away from that. I did a teacher training session up in the Black Rock Education Centre last night, kind of illustrating this. I got all about 30 teachers between, between the ages of 30 to 60, taught them how to make websites and so on. And um, It's more that people are realising that the department <clears throat> hasn't taken a proactive step on this, and if they do, due to bureaucracy and red tape, that could take a long time to implement. So people are starting to go outside the system and do this and bring it back in. I would add to that, um, we have uh, one of the champions of uh, Coda Dojo, uh, Dublin, Eugene, is actually uh, involved in the Irish Computer Society's input into the curriculum because there is a move to make a, a junior cert module. Now, um, we have absolutely every respect and support for other educational systems. And that said, we've deliberately baked into this uh, a lot of features that you wouldn't normally imagine. So we spent a lot of time coming up with the name. Um, and the brand. It wouldn't have worked and travelled so far if it had taken the original name of Saturday Morning Programming Class for Kids. <laughs> um, the brand itself, though, Coda Dojo, um, a dojo is a, is a martial arts temple of learning. And uh, that is actually the model that we try and replicate. Now, uh, I don't know anyone here done a martial art. You, you, okay, so one person, that's great. You would, I, I, you would know, though, that when you go to a martial arts dojo, um, you don't have somebody at the front of the room with a blackboard drawing out the moves that you're going to make. Right? You have a subject matter expert and you have a group of attentive students who interact with each other in terms of sparring, but also you have people of varying abilities helping each other out, learning, sparring with them, gaining knowledge, and then you have some top 
subject matter experts who can really answer any question, any problem. And that model is how dojos work. Now, it's proven to be extremely effective. Um, it, it has the best elements of, of childhood learning. Um, it is highly social, so not only are we making gener a generation of, of uh, you know, high-tech wonder, wonderkins, we're also um, having them play well with others, which is, you know, if you've worked with technical people, that can sometimes be a gap. And um, so, you know, if you look at the, the, the system of education itself, not just the departments and the bureaucracy, but actually the way Western education occurs, and you compare it with the dojo system of educating, you know, there is a lot of arguments to say that, uh, the, that, the, the, that, that Eastern philosophical learning system actually could be applied to a lot more different things. Um, you know, dojos have been around for a couple of thousand years. They're a global success, arguably. They you know, martial arts graduates are everywhere, even though there may be only a, a few in the room. Um, whereas the Western education system arguably has quite a few issues that are unresolved and may never be resolved. Um, I just spent the day with uh, the good folks at Educate Together running a workshop with them. And I think they've got some great ideas and they're, they're, they're making a huge impact. At the same time, I still see that they're constrained within a model and we've come up with a different model um, and it's working. And the other thing I'd like to say about Kota Dojo is uh, it's resolutely free. You know, we don't have a bank account. We don't have a central bureaucracy. About the most central stuff we have is a website and he just about kills himself keeping it together. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and people might say, well, that makes us, uh, us vulnerable. Actually, it makes us strong. Because in some of the toughest economic times we've ever seen, uh, this movement has gone in under a year from one dojo to 104 globally, to 40 dojos in Ireland alone, to thousands of kids actually learning to get this passion and to, to get interested at the right age. There's a lot of um, evidence to suggest that your brain is at its most neuroplastic when you are between the age of 7 and 17. That is the ideal time to learn languages. It is a mistake in my view to view coding as a science. It is much more akin to learning a great language and if you learn to become a native speaker, you know, the best, po the best programmers I know are, are, are like poets. They can cram so much more into so few lines of code. You know, um, I once worked in a project where they suggested that we would pay the programmers based on how many lines of code they would write. <laughs> and, and that just didn't work, right? Because, you know, great code is very compact, it's refined, and it does a lot with very little. Great user interface design the same. That's not something that is, comes easy to somebody who comes aboard late in life. It's not impossible, but it's much more difficult. So if you can get that interest and you can get that dual language ability young, we, we find that's very powerful. Um, can I ask a question? My sister is involved in the um, setting up the Athlone Coder Dojo. So I went down to see my little nephew, he's five when he started and now he's six. And it's quite interesting the link with the dojo because he's big into his Kung Po and another uh, evening of the week. But the one thing that I suppose slightly saddened me as a woman was the sheer lack of girls <laughs> At the Coder Dojo. So, so I took a great exception to one part of James's um, presentation where he said it's like the Boy Scouts for Code. I would say it's like the Scouts for Code, yeah. uh, which includes boys and girls. Uh, there are plenty of dojos, Kinsale amongst them, where there are actually more girls than boys. Um, and we have lots of girl mentors, and uh, you know, it's something that we are utterly committed to, to getting not just a, a gender balance, but an overall equality. Yeah. Um, to that end too, we, we've just partnered with Kamara who do the, the recycling of laptops to schools. Uh, they're offering us their hubs across Africa and Jamaica to host dojos in developing nations. So we, we're trying to make sure that wherever this can take root and flower and blossom, it does. Um, one particular trick I've discovered is if you start a dojo, go to the local girls school and announce it there first. <laughs> And you tend to get more girls come to the dojo first. And, you know, it, it seems that if lots of girls attend the dojo, you know, guys eventually show up anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> kind of adding on to that as well, at the moment in, in technology, about, about 7 to 9% of uh, all programmers are female. So there's a massive imbalance. And it's been something that um, at quite a lot of conferences I've been to, there's been a lot of discussion around. 
Um, and as Bill said, um, it, it varies in some dojos, but uh, majority of them we do see a very good balance between 30 to 40 percent. And even in New York last weekend, um, they had uh, 60, 60 children at that and 50 percent were female. Um, so it is something that um, no, we're starting to see a change up, but obviously across all dojos, I mean, I thought... Yeah, that no one now wasn't good yeah. experience because there was just a handful out of the whole group, um, very low numbers. I was just wondering, is it, you know, something that you could do that was girl-centric, you know, because they do different dentists, so yeah. just something, and I, I think it's a huge loss because I, I don't think that women are any <laughs> less able to do No, the, I meant that like... Um, but I if mean, you're stereotyping at that age, it's a bit scary. It is, I and mean, it, it's something that, um, like, personally I haven't quite cracked why coding is so, so appealing to majority of males and not all females. Um, there's, there's something actually very interesting we were talking about before that um, back in... Back in, and we're going way back, but back in Russia, prior to the uh, uh, to America's influence, um, there's a greater number of academics and scientists who were female than males. Um, but when uh, American TV came in and so on, and portrayed females in you know the home roles and so on, and males out um, working, being the breadwinners, that completely dropped. Um, I mean, out of it was something like it, they actually had to put in, in quotas in place in Russia so that males could get into the universities to do these types of things. Um, and that's that's just a small side thing, but it, it's still something that um, the technology community is, is very aware of and is trying to combat. Um, and I think maybe in some of the more, in the I mean, there's a bit of a size difference between Athlone and New York, but um, for these kind of smaller types of communities, um, things that can be done to try and encourage more females. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know what has done the trick and can say if there's such... Literally promoting it to the girls' school first. Mm. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, seriously, seriously it's, it's an issue that we, we do take very seriously. At the same time, you know, we are a, an open childhood learning oh, no, no, no. organization. So, <laughs> one of the issues that we have is that we don't want to be prescriptive. Yeah. So, everything we try and do, we, we, we try and do through encouragement, and you know, that's our curriculum. Yeah. Is encouragement. You know, people say, "Oh, it's 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 the language." No, no, no. The curriculum is encouragement. The rule set is be cool. Yeah, we, we've tried to make it very simple so yeah. that it can replicate. So, in terms of the, like, do you have a curriculum in terms of what is done every week, or is that just purely down to the volunteers deciding it, what it they want to? It varies from dojo to dojo. We have a couple of lessons that we think are, are, are really good. Like the first, just that class moment, seeing that seeing somebody install a text editor and actually edit their first web page seems to be a pretty universal mm -hmm. one. Um, some dojos are more formal, some are less, some focus more on scratch, some don't. Um, you know, in, in Kota Dojo, in, in um, the Science Gallery in Dublin, because they have a lecture theatre, they do get guest speakers who do lectures. Mm -hmm. um, in Marne Point, uh, we have sort of a, a, one giant room and we have a couple of projectors, and so we have newbies at one end and then we have intermediate and then we have advanced and you could get any sort of presentation in any of those things. Um, one of the other innovations that we're doing in Mind Point is that we're starting a, a, a kind of incubator program because we have a few companies that like you know recently Dharma Software is it's a, a couple of guys who are, I think 17, 16, 17, 18 years of age have started their own web development company and so we're giving them a space Without rent initially, to then start up their company and then move elsewhere in the building once they're once they're up to speed. Um, you know, Harry with his pizza bot has been making money <laughs> from 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 Coda Dojo from the very start. And pizza bot started as an open discussion between kids. You know, who who wanted to create what app? Mm. Um, and we see lots of that. You know, the 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 the, the desire to learn is there. And a lot of what we do is, is just get out of people's way. I mean, one of the things I do a lot in Mind Point is just tell the, the parents, I'm happy that they put their hands up, but I'm not happy when they touch the keyboard. <laughs> so I say, look, just let no. your child <laughs> have the keyboard. <laughs> I think the other thing to say is with such a, um, oops, sorry, open and flexible system, the fact that you see in Dublin a, a different type of environment to Cork and you see different results out of each. Um, on a global scale, it makes it very interesting because then um, it can, as different places do things better, they can incorporate it to the overall system. Um, I mean, even in the sense of um, how, when we started off, how you know, booking was done, how people would get spaces, um, that came out of an incident in, 
in Dublin where we had uh, 20 people sign up for our first and we were like excellent small number first one outside of Cork and we had about 60 show up and Google security staff freaking out and so on <laughs> um, and so as so as each uh, each dojo do new things and have different environments it kind of feeds back so there's a question I was just going to ask when you're talking about uh, taking the parents hands away from the keyboard do you ever get inquiries about a separate sort of dojo for parents all the time um, my answer is, is basically, if you want to come to a Kota Dojo, um, adults must be accompanied by a minor. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, um, you, you know, uh, somebody, somebody said, oh, I'll have to rob a child. Uh, well, no, it's not what I meant. <laughs> um, that, that said, the, the tragedy that was about to befall us was that an entire generation of kids was going to grow up completely as digital users with almost no digital creatives and those few that did do become digital creatives were going to do it isolated by themselves in their bedroom without support and that just doesn't work you know i don't see any upside from that system persisting so as long as we can keep a context and an environment where learning happens naturally for free so that anyone can be included. I, mean, I think free is the ultimate point of inclusion. That to me is, is, is mission accomplished. And if it's growing around the world, that's also great because I believe it does Ireland's brand good to have Cork seen as the centre of the IT universe by a whole lot of kids. You know, like on Saturday, there were a whole bunch of kids in LA that were you know, aware that Cork was where this thing started. Sorry, Ian. Yeah. yeah um, sorry, actually. Um, I'm just wondering, are kids into what I do type in the first place? Majority, we, yeah, the majority can just do it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a weird one. Like, um, Does, do you know the way, like, yeah. you've learned, you, I'm saying a self taught typist, but I do it wrong. So I'm constantly correcting myself. And I just think that a lot of people, there's so much time wasted backspacing for me. Yeah. Um, but I just kind of. Um, it's the same way I learned to use paintbrush by painting. Um, like it's just a lot of kids can instinctively do it. And again, as Bill said, it's this digital generation. You, you know, people are freaked out now because they're seeing like you know two and three year olds that can use iPhones already instinctively. And a lot of things have been des designed to be as you know to be used as natively as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's but it's not something that we have has really kind of crossed our minds. Kids it, can it, it comes up when you get like a four year old who is, is very hunt and peck mm. and you think to yourself, well, oh, maybe we should be teaching typing. I've had that thought. I mean, I don't think you should be teaching it, but I think it should be taught elsewhere in the system, you know? Yeah, very possibly. At, at the same time, um, you know, I see other kids who just touch type faster than I ever will. And they're, you know, we, we have... Um, it's also, you know, if you have a programming editor, you know, it's a different style of... of Keyboard interaction, anyway, in my view. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a you know there's a nine year old down in in Cork who's one of the best JavaScript developers I've ever seen, and he types faster than I think I'll ever imagine. Um, and yeah, he's nine. <laughs> he's about that tall. <laughs> yeah, so it, it varies. I think also uh, we're starting to see things like Scratch, which are very which are symbolic languages that that you you, you sort of move blocks around to make the program work. And there are things like Google Blockly, which are actually taking that. You can assemble the program in blocks and then press a button and it turns into JavaScript or it turns into Python. Um, so I think that there are going to be some innovations in user interfaces that are coming that may reduce the need to type significantly. I think Apple Siri is another interesting thing. Uh, you, you know, it still amazes me that this thing here, which is you know an iPad 2, 3, whatever, um, is still programmed with the most basic text editor in the world on generally you know on on, on, on a desktop computer. That's it's kind of a anarchy anachronism, you know. Can I just ask the question, which uh, smartphone do you have and why? Um, <laughs> <laughs> is this for GQ magazine? <laughs> oh an um, Apple by a yeah, um, no I use a so I um, I'm fairly, when it comes to smartphones and uh, computers, I'm fairly agnostic with it, but uh, at the moment I'm, I'm using a, an iPhone, simply because I, I also develop um, iPhone um, apps as well. 
Um, and um, I don't know, they've had a... Uh, you could get into a whole debate about why Android is, is it differs to um, iOS in terms of not just visually, but the teams and the emphasis that they both have on them. But um, I, uh, no, I just I, I kind of like iOS. That's, that's what I use. Um, I have to ask the question quite differently. I have an iPad, the last iPad, and I have Skype on it. And I have a, a nice monster headset. headset. I develop um, iPad apps, um, not iPhone apps. I do not carry a mobile phone at all anymore. <laughs> I'll, get the whole, I'll get the holy water now while I can throw it. Possibly the most controversial thing you heard the first at the end of the See, I'm, I'm not lying. It's not there. I don't have one. It's just, it's just the, uh, the, the iPad and, and not even a Bluetooth headset. I have um, an actual you know, plug it in headset. So that's it. That's for me. So I know that I. Yep, sure, got it. From when you started out, you were kind of surprised. You said you were surprised, you know, from whatever the, the after school session yeah. and when Google turned up and, and the success that it grew from there. What do you think was the key ingredients that um, made the success it is now? And, and then, secondly, then, you know, where it's at now, where do you see the next, next step? Like the League of Kamara, I think that's excellent, it's brilliant. It's linking up, okay, obviously, you're saying exposure, so the, the IT equipment and stuff has been supplied in developing countries. And um, I think that's a great. Uh, Thanks. So, um, I think that the that there was a, a couple of couple of elements for it. I think one, it was kind of uh, around the, the right time, and the people were legitimately like, as a result, people were interested in this because it kind of brought a new light to a lot of these things that they're doing. Like, hey, I can make uh, you know iPhone apps and mm. seeing things in a new light. But I think also the fact that it, it wasn't school and that we took a, a, a different teaching style and approach than school. I mean, school sucks for you know kids. Or when I was teaching it. You know, I'd be in there for five days a week, and people, you know, when people came to the coding club after school, they didn't want that same environment. Yeah. Um, so it was just a lot more fun and engaging, and it was it was leisurely. People enjoyed being there. Um, but I think it was, I think a lot of it is, is just, was just timing. Um, the fact that you know, it's and it's 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 again with this generation who've grown up completely in this world. I suppose the next steps for Coder Ocho, it's um, Coder Ocho is is exploding. I mean, it's. Today is the twenty eighth, is it? Or today is the twenty sixth? It's, yeah. it's to two days. It's a year old. Yeah, in two days it's one year old. My my vision for Ireland would be to have three thousand dojos, one in every county, one in every parish. Uh, I've done the numbers. You can actually have a ten person dojo in the smallest parish in Ireland very easily on the current numbers. There would be a mentor around to do that. I would love to see that happen. Uh, globally, I'd like to see similar impact. I'd also like to see dojos teaching all sorts of other stuff. In Galway, they created a thing called AppSpeak, where they're trying to link up dojos in different parts of the world to learn different languages, not computer languages, but actual human languages. That's credited we, to, you know... We start yeah. Chinese on Saturday. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I think AppSpeak is, is, is fantastic. It's that sort of thing. You know, there really is a powerful a power in, 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 in the system of learning that a dojo has that I think is untapped, that, that can be used. You know, if you can teach karate and you can teach programming, there's got to be a lot of other things that can be you know, uh, taught. Now, I would say that in a different way, actually. It's not about teaching, it's about having people learn. Mm -hmm. And so if you create an environment where people learn, mm -hmm. where young people learn especially, uh, that can be adapted to lots of things. And it would delight me completely just to see this sweep the world. Um, and uh, not for anything other than I believe it's 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 good for us as a species to have more learning occurring for free and quality learning. And I, like I think as well with with Coder Ocho, the way it's going is it, it's transcending just a organisation. It's becoming more that we think of soccer as a sport. And you'd go to a soccer mm -hmm. club or have an organisation, and I think that's just the mentality we've kept on it. Um, and I think for a lot of young people now, it's it's got a sense of identity associated with it. Um, like I'm still. Like, you, it started surprising me when, when kids would brand themselves as you know people who go to Coder Dojo that they're a part of like their local dojo. Um, so I think that you know the same way that people who would have gone to Scouts and they you know they wouldn't call a Scout or, or whatever. And I think that yeah, there is a tendency with it. And, and it's all kids as well. Actually, it's not just uh, the closet nerd. You know, it's uh, one thing that struck me. You like to say you've got football guys who have been playing football in the morning, and then you've got guys coming in the karate suits actually. Uh, because they want to cry afterwards, so yeah, it's it's so inclusive. 
So, and, and, and that's, I think, one of the myths of, of, of you know, being a creative. I think it's very possible to be uh, you know, good at sport, good at creativity, good at writing, good at, good at, good at music, good at, good at a whole range of things. I think we we're, we're all have the capacity to be multi-talented if we're encouraged. And a lot of the, the sort of narrowing that we see is, is actually a hangover from a, a, a different time. And, and we need to adapt that. Sorry, we have another question here. Sorry guys, I miss like young people in the along on the other side. And just while you speaking, comes to my mind, how can you make it so that, how can you gain the, the, the people get into it, whatever you're doing? Uh, I just heard, I remember, remember a while ago, I heard a speech from Colin Powell from the US. He said that uh, one day his secretary came to the office and said, uh, Colin, we need to get a Facebook page. He, had, he said, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, that's not, that's not me. And he said, we started it later, we just created last night and we have 10,000 followers. I can't take it down. And he just said, the point was that he had no choice. And a lot of people, they don't have choice because it's so attractive or something. Mm -hmm. You can't actually, but you feel disconnected. How can you very commonly get interest in people that can get involved? One of the things, one of the things that got me completely hooked was when Jane shared his story about there was an a announcement over the school PA and people sought him out. I don't know if you remember being at school, but seeking out the nerd is not actually a behavior that's common. There are more teams, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so that told me that if a random announcement in a random school can result in unusual behavior and created this demand, that, that that meant there was market demand there and, and that we should do something to fulfill that demand. Um, and so all we've done is try and replicate that first thing, which is get the announcement over the PA system. This thing exists. It does work. People love it. The young people love it. The mentors love it. Now, I have mentors in Mount Point who come up to me at the end of each session with the biggest smiles on their faces because something's worked, someone got something and they're just totally buzzed. I invite you all, come and just spend five minutes in a Coda Dojo anywhere and I will, I will, will absolutely stand and say that, you, that you, will, you will come away going, wow, that's a lot of energy in that room. Now, maybe the gender balance wasn't perfect, uh, but uh, you would have to agree that the energy in the room is pretty amazing, right? That, that, that is really buzzy for and really good and, and renewing for the mentors. And you know, whether you turn up to one dojo a month or, or, or one dojo a week, the, the response has been that, that, that just that energy is a, a benefit to the mentors. So I believe that everybody in the system is actually benefiting from it. And the people who donate the spaces for three hours a week or four hours a week also are getting better football, fo footfall, better recognition. Um, they're seeing, you know, a community form around their venue that wasn't there before. And I think these things actually give us a very long-term sustainable impact as well. And, and again, keep the costs to, to zero. Yeah, I just, uh, to interject, we have, um, so the Father of Ocean Rights is in Ireland, right? We have our dojo kids demo stuff they've made all the last five months to thousands of tourists, like you know, so like Bill said, it's not even it's transcendent classroom now actually, and it's really putting Ireland on the map, like you know. So it's it's pretty spectacular. And those are the type of things you don't foresee, but yeah. they're really positive spin-offs. What about the dojos in Dublin? You mentioned there are seven dojos. Um how how do they differ as in from place to place, Adrian was speaking about uh, the dojos in Galway? A lot of it just comes down to demand. That there there is so much sheer demand that people want um, that people are willing to to travel to other places to do it, and I mean, it kind of also falls down into like uh, availability of space um, and then accessibility. Um, so, like Dublin, uh, the one in the Science Gallery in Pier Street, um, taken nineteen of Saturday, and that was the, the kind of first one, and that's quite often the flagship one for Dublin. Um, and then you have one out in DCU and Blanchestown and DIT and, and a few other places as well. Um, and it was in the car with someone from Cavan Dojo today. <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, a lot of it just comes down to, to pure demand, and it's not that we're you know we're like the you know the, the sound of music we're teaching the world to code. It's that 
um, to have something there for kids that want to do it and have them know that this exists and this is there and what we've simply seen is that there is just a massive demand for it. And all of the adults that are there, they're there with a rented or stolen child. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's confirmed. Well, and, and of course the parents. Yeah, parents are there. Yeah, we, 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 we're quite, even though we have uh, one rule, we have a pretty strong guideline on, on yeah. parents sticking around. Um, it helps the interaction, it makes the community better, it gives the dojo more strength, and it also um, breaks down a lot of barriers. So I do see parents learning stuff side by side, and I do see parents having very open discussions that I don't normally see you know, um, in, in other environments, which is kind of cool. Yeah, and um, just being in the energy of the room also helps enormously. That was a very clever rule. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I know that uh, James is anxious is anxious to head off. Yes, I have to run. Um, has to hop on his longboard and as 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 try to yeah. not get hit by the car. <laughs> so I want to thank you, obviously, for everything you shared with us today. I think we've all found it quite informative. And um, we will have a copy of your slides, and obviously the video will be available on our website. For uh, that, that's an interesting point, though. The, you know, you're actually learning by teaching. Yes. Because isn't that, you know, it's like telling a joke, you won't remember the joke unless you, you tell it straight away. Uh, uh, absolutely, and that is actually a fundamental part of, of the dojo um, system of learning. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're very happy that that happens, and that, and that, that really is part of the design. Um, it's, it's funny that part of the impetus for the name and, and so forth is because my own kids do kendo and James has also done kendo and not many people know this but kendo dojos are also free right? do you not, as kendo sensei is not supposed to charge and so uh, you know, I figured if, if, if they can be doing that for a thousand years <laughs> globally you know, we, we can do the same um, Another thing I notice, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, I've only got basic coding skills, you know, I couldn't be very useful and all the rest of it. Actually, that's not true. Encur you, anyone can encourage anyone else. And um, even the most basic skills are, are great. I, I've had some of the most advanced coders I've ever seen come into the dojo, give a lecture, and halfway through the lecture, realize that half their audience is actually ahead of them. <laughs> so it, it's okay that you're not maybe, you know, fully up to speed, as long as you can do encouragement, as long as you can help people find stuff out on Google, um, you're absolutely welcome to be a mentor. I suppose you, can I just ask one more question? You, there's 104 dojos around the world. Um, Should be 105 by now. <laughs> <laughs> Any marked differences between them all? I mean, I know you uh, haven't gotten the, to see them. They're all different. Every single one of them is different. Um, it's one of the beauties of, of having an organization that, that has a context. There are some things that are universal and there are a lot of things that are completely variable. And that is good. It makes us robust. It makes us diverse. Um, I'm a great believer in, in the power of diversity and the power of listening to nature. And I think children have got a great nature if you just let them you know, collaborate, let them work together. Uh, I'm, regularly told that you know by, by parents walking into the dojo that their, their kids just are never this obedient <laughs> you know never this quiet never this uh, you know focused uh, until they until they hit the dojo which is which, yeah I'm pretty pretty proud about so have we any more questions i'm just interested in how it has spread so quickly if somebody in new york I'm, how does the quarter dojo come into being in new york for example do you encourage um, well, we, we, you know, I did a lot of work on, on social networking and on viral marketing um, in, in you know, parts of my career. And so we wanted to make sure that it was a brand that travelled, that had you know, a reasonable amount of central backup in terms of a, a nice website. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it was easy to follow. You know, if you're going to make a movement, you want to be easy to follow. So we wanted to, to make it very simple. Uh, I think it's two pages and you read those two pages and you can start a dojo. Um, so part of it was just making it easy, part of it making it, it you know, the brand kind of cool and interesting uh, and the rest has just been trying to get as much word of mouth and as much PR as possible. So you know, James and I both speak wherever we can, we share the stories. 
not just of the dojos, but of the kids in the dojos. So I talked about Harry, I talked about Dharma Software. I'm always trying to celebrate what's going on in, in, in various dojos because that gets the story out. That's much more interesting. So far, that's all we've done. And people take this, they take the initiative themselves to set this up. Yep. Um, most dojos have a, a one or two, maybe three champions. They might not be coders. They, you know, they're, they're probably parents. Um, they want this for their kid because their kid is, 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 is really passionate about this but currently spending a lot of time in their bedroom. And, um, they're looking for something that's more social. And so they, they, they start it. And you know, they contact us through the website. And the first thing we tell them is read the instructions, find yourself a venue. Once they have a venue, uh, we put the, put it up on the site. Um, you know, we're, we've just announced a partnership with Hayes, who are a specialist recruitment agency. So we're going to start getting mentors uh, through their through their uh, IT recruitment network. Um, you know, if they can't find a free venue, you know, we'll try and hook them up with a local sponsor if we can find one. Um, you know, Intel sponsors the Science Gallery uh, dojo. Most of the dojos are sponsored by the owner of the building. Um, but some, you know, very high-profile locations are sponsored by other sponsors. Um, and once the, the venue is, is in and we've got a mentor, then the rest is up to them how often they want to schedule. Um, and usually the first dojo is maybe 20 kids and then the next is 50, 60, and then you've got a queue. Um, in Ross Carberry, which is not the biggest town in Ireland, they've got 40 kids in the dojo. In Clonakilty, the experimental night they had uh, where they were just like running, doing a dry run, and you know, 35 kids showed up. Um, and the next week, the, the room was packed. Um, you know, the demand for this, the desire, just to even peek behind the the curtain and have a just a little look, just a taste of how you can actually change something in the computer sphere, sphere how you can bend the internet to your will, and just even a little bit, that desire is massive and it's, it's everywhere. So it's, it's pretty easy for them to, to set up. The interesting thing to me has been how consistently they've continued though. Um, so far we've yet to see a dojo start and then stop. All of them have continued, which I, I think is also a great thing because the other part of my vision is that I want to see the, the kids who end up very talented in the dojos also stick around and, 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 and bring on the next generation and the next generation. Um, have, you, have you encountered any kind of a level of opposition um, in the IT world or digital world more generally? I noticed you said that um, you use, you operate in an open source basis, and I'm just wondering, is, is it the case that it would ever be considered that you're, you're training essentially people with the same skills and, um, who might compete with people who are already established in the IT world, or is it embraced as more as a spirit of... Um, innovation will be created, people come up with newer and better ideas. Most of the commercial training things that I've seen have been things like um, W3 schools and Code Academy, and uh, we see the, them as allies rather than opponents. Okay. Um, so, so far everyone's been very welcoming and very happy to, to, to work with us. We, I think you know, we offer, um, and we're starting to offer um, belts and badges, uh, we're not offering certification. So, you know, I think most of the, the heavily commercial um, institutions are, you know, selling certification. They're not actually selling the course as much as they are the certification. So I don't think we conflict. I mean, if anything, I think we, 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 we complement what they do. So I think, I think that's probably um, a lovely place to uh, start. And I like our to end this. I like what you said about... Um, sort of embracing the nature of children and allowing children, I suppose, to find the solutions and the very fact that the dojos are very much child-centric and it's all about learning. Um, I think that's something that's really inspiring, especially in these current times. The Thanks. very fact that you work on a, um, you're a non-profit organisation and you operate for free is also very commendable. Um, and I think it means that um, for families that are struggling, this is a very necessary skill that you'll essentially have opened up to um, so many more people. And I hope that your ambition that there would be, what is it, 7,000, 3,000? Three, well, there's... Th Around 3,000 GA halls in the country. I don't see why we can't have 3,000 dojos as okay, well. Okay, 3,000 dojos. Um, I, I think it's very possible to, to, to you know, pick up a hurl one day and pick up a keyboard the next. Absolutely. And I think both are excellent. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Bill for Thanks. joining us today. Thank you so much. And Please also, spread the word. <laughs> and, yeah, obviously, if you can click on the more hits we have on our website, the better, and spread the word. 
uh, you can obviously tweet um, about our event today and we'd be glad to hear any of your feedback. Our next Young Professional Network event will be a table quiz which will be hosted in the Mercantile in Dame Street on the 11th or the 12th of July rather and I'll be in contact with you about that. So thank you so much for staying and there's some nibbles and wine if you'd like to stay on for some time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.